Okay. We're going to start. We'll let some folks in. We'll give them a couple minutes to join us. I'll find my book links here. All right, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica Stockton Banulo. I'm the owner of Greenlight and I am thrilled to be talking tonight with fellow bookseller, Jeff Deutsch about his new book in praise of good bookstores. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Jeff and to the team at Princeton University Press for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We are grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection, whether in our stores or in this virtual space. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. I know you all know how to use Zoom, but just so we're all on the same page. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, us, but we can't see or hear you, but we can see that you're here. And there are a couple of different ways you can interact with each other and with the author throughout tonight's event. And we highly encourage that. The first one is the chat. Um, that's the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post any comments and thoughts in the chat. We'd love to see where you're logging in from, hear what you think. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you do have a specific question that you'd like to have answered by Jeff tonight, please post that question in the Q&A. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And very importantly, tonight's featured book in praise of good bookstores is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue stores, and you can purchase Jeff's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup in the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop that by link in the chat again in a minute. And as thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off on the featured book. So if you put in the code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 in the coupon discount section at, at checkout online, you can get 10% off when you order that way. So if you care about supporting not only the careers of authors, but the careers of booksellers, and if you're interested in the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is one good way to show your support. So it is such a treat for me as a bookseller and a bookstore owner to have the chance to talk with Jeff tonight. Jeff Deutsch is the director of Chicago's Seminary Co-op Bookstores, which in 2019, he helped incorporate as the first not-for-profit bookstore whose mission is bookselling. Our two bookstores have been in conversation over the years through all our respective changes. And Jeff is always a refreshing voice in the book industry conversation who invites and inspires us to think about old questions in new ways. And even when we don't come to the same conclusions, that conversation is always enormously valuable. And of course, his brand new book, In Praise of Good Bookstores, is an eloquent and charming reflection on the singular importance of bookstores. Unsurprisingly, Jeff is one of the great readers. His book is full of allusions and erudite phrases, but it was wonderful to discover what a talented writer he is as well. Of course, as a bookseller, I was underlining and scribbling a lot of notes in the margins, but I think anyone who loves bookstores will find something to engage or inspire them in this book. So Jeff's gonna start us off with a reading and then we'll be talking about it together and taking some of your questions after that. Jeff, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you for hosting me. It's really special to be in a, a Brooklyn bookstore uh, doing this, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit from the introduction. Uh, it'll be about five minutes and uh, share a little bit about what uh, propelled me to write the book and how I was thinking about uh, both my background and the work of celebration of good bookstores. Sometimes the mere existence of a phenomenon, a human, an institution, a work of art, is worthy of awe. Its declaration cannot be countermanded. When I first ascended the perilous staircase leading to the old co-op in 1994, the bookstore was in its heyday. Like many who came before and after me, I was deeply persuaded by the seminary co-op's existence. The bookstore was a realization of a humble but powerful vision, a broad selection of books whose presence on the shelf created an unparalleled browsing experience, undiluted by tchotchkes or knickknacks pen wipers or gramophone discs, and only the occasional puffy or pallid volume. The collection created a totalizing environment. Engagement with this landscape of book spines shifted the patron's sense of space, time, abundance, value, and community. 
To a confused and restless young man trying to find his way in the world who knew only that the presence of books was of paramount importance, the co-op seemed as close to a spiritual home as he could hope to find. It was in fact a religion predicated upon books from which I was attempting to take my leave. But even then I knew that whatever else was left behind, the presence of books would remain. I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish community in and around Brooklyn. The rooms of my childhood in Flatbush, Borough Park, and Elizabeth, New Jersey were all book lines. My childhood homes, my yeshivas, my shul, my relatives' homes. The homes of my friends' families were heavy with large books. From 1957 until 2012, my grandparents lived in a second floor walk-up apartment that they rented in Borough Park in the corner of 16th Avenue and 53rd Street. My grandfather's library, a rather book-lined living room, made a particular impression. The bookcases were filled with books whose gravity was clear from the ornate uniform spines. Ornate these books, but not ornamental. The bookshelves always had gaps and the gaps would move from week to week. An ever-rotating selection of volumes would be laid out on my grandfather's bookstand and desk. These books were read. They were treated with reverence and love. Observant Jews are accustomed to kissing the cover of a book after closing it, a habit that has remained with me throughout the years. Along with the British literatus Lee Hunt, who in effusing about books wrote of how he liked to lean his head against them, followers of my given tradition might say, when I speak of being in contact with books, I mean it literally. These books were read in groups called chavrusas, a Hebrew word whose root means friend. When I was a young boy, I would join my grandfather's chavrusa on occasion just to observe. Seated on an austere bench in the basement of the shul across the street, my head barely clearing the table top, I sat with large men in their large Aramaic books, watching them question, ponder, argue with, and delight in what they found in those pages. My grandfather wasn't a scholar. He was a shopkeep. He ran a suit store named Chatham Clothes on New Utrecht Avenue, selling kosher clothing to the Haredi Jews in the tri-state area. He worked long days after which he would eat dinner with his family before heading across the street to learn with his chavrusa. The activity called learning was common because there was only one thing to study, the Tanakh and its many commentaries, especially the Talmud. There was no need to specify the object of learning. Learning was a daily activity regardless of one's age and was no less special for being an everyday endeavor. And learning, while it reliably yielded wisdom and pleasure, was understood to be an end in itself. The highest compliment one could pay in that community was to say that someone was learned or a Talmud Chacham, a wise student. When as a teenager I moved into the secular world, I found some of the conventions around books and education profoundly alien. I couldn't fathom the notion that one strove to become educated rather than learned, or that one might study in order to make a living rather than to learn continually an endeavor essential to living a more meaningful life. What after all was the point of making a living if not to build community and create deeper understanding, to come home for dinner and then learn with one's chavrusa. The Chicago poet Nate Marshall once said during an event at the seminary co-op that the greatest thing a poet or poem can give you is permission. A bookstore too, it turns out, can give you permission. That is precisely what that first descent into the co-op established permission to be among books outside of an institution of learning, be it a university or yeshiva, and outside of a teleological par paradigm. The best parts of the tradition in which I was raised valued not only what endures, but also meaningful ephemera, what the philosopher Simone Weil gestures toward in writing stars and blossoming fruit trees. Utter permanence and extreme fragility give one an equal sense of eternity. It sought pleasures, not the deceits of pleasures. It sought to feed appetites whose satiety led to a satisfaction that endured and led to an appetite for further meaning, knowledge, and love. A pleasure whose verdure remains. Thanks, Jeff. I love that. And that's a phrase that gets repeated sometimes in the book, a pleasure whose verdure remains. It's such a beautiful phrase. Um, so I, I love how you in this book um, connect the work of the bookstore, the work of the bookseller to the faith of your childhood, which is not, you don't have the same relationship to as you used to, but that informs some of your thinking about books and about community. So can you talk a little about that as a starting place? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and I, um, 
you know, the neighborhood in Borough Park, I haven't been in about five years, but when I was there five years ago, it was more or less identical uh, to how it was 30 years ago, um, including most of the same shops and shopkeeps and, um, and the shul was right across the street was still there. Um, and, you know, thinking about the endurance of that way of life, of uh, studying these books and, and the way in which those books brought a community together and particularly a community that really is a wandering community. There is no homeland, uh, right? Uh, the, like part of what defines the Jews is, is being a wandering people. And we made of the book and these books our homeland. And that was the thing that we carried with us. Um, and this you know, goes back, depending on how, you know, how you look at it, thousands of years. And there's something really powerful about what it means to have this um, binding agents uh, of that book. Uh, one of the things that the Chavrusa does, and this is this is relatively recent, is something called the Dafyomi, which is literally the page of the day, where every single Jew who is studying the Talmud is studying the exact same page, and it's a cycle to get through all 63 uh, uh, tractates. And that notion, to me, is so powerful. However, if we're not a believer, I'm not a believer, then um, that pull of the presence of books is powerful, but how do you shift that orthodoxy into a heterodoxy? and bring people together with diverse viewpoints, diverse interests, and find a home for them there. And that, to me, is what the bookstore and the library and all of these book spaces has done. Absolutely. Heterodoxy is another, another great idea that sort of runs through the book, I think. Um, but I wanted to, I, I admit that I, I wrestled a little bit in terms of heterodoxy with the title of your book, which isn't just in praise of independent bookstores or in praise of bookstores, it's in praise of good bookstores. So I feel like that good is doing a lot of work there. And I wonder if you could talk about what you mean by good. Is there, is there a way to be a good bookstore? Or are, or are there many ways? Are there bookstores that are not good? Um, and what, what, were you, what were you aiming at with that title? <laughs> That's such a good question. No, no one has asked me that yet. And I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I struggled with it too. And I'll tell you that we, um, you know, we, we both came up in, in bookselling and you've, you've worked in some of the best bookstores in, in, in New York. And then you built uh, one of the best bookstores in New York, which is astonishing to me. And I'm interested in talking a bit about that. Uh, one thing that happened in our culture and the bookselling culture is that we really, you know, took this independent bookselling model and it really mattered to be independent. That was so important to us. And I remember having arguments with some of our peers saying, why don't we just call ourselves bookstores? What do we, do? What do we need to like say we're independent? Who cares? Like we can just be bookstores and that's enough. Um, so I, I appreciate the question on, on that level too. Um, the good bookstore, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of great bookstores and I think that even like halfway decent bookstores are great joy and better than most other things. So like, I love bookstores. Like there's no question. Like, even a bad bookstore, bookstore is, a, is even, good. Even a quote unquote bad bookstore <laughs> is, is a great joy to me. And, um, uh, but the idea of the good life, you know, you're thinking about Socrates and, 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 and the way that the Greeks thought about the good life, the capital G, capital L, or the good society, like these kinds of concepts where good enough is good enough. Like, like it's not about being great. It's actually about what it means to, to be good. And to, and to um, so I feel like that concept is, is really what I'm gesturing toward a bit. Um, and the thing that the book celebrates and slightly for a moment you know, has concern about is the fact that bookstores don't have a model to be bookstores. They have a model to be retail retailers and sell things that aren't books to help support the book selling. But there isn't a model for pure book selling, meaning just selling books. And part of what I, uh, the celebration is saying, remember those spaces that are just books and, uh, or when you're just in the book section and not thinking about other things, like what can happen, uh, in, you know, internally and really calling to that uh, experience and that uh, cultural good and and trying to advocate on behalf of this this model yeah i feel like when people are like oh it's too bad it's so hard to run a bookstore because no one reads anymore i'm like that's not actually the issue <laughs> right that's not the <laughs> issue right. Um, right but it's but it's the the business model itself is so difficult and and it's it's, the margins are so thin, even in the best of cases. So, I mean, a lot of stores like ours make the decision to sell a variety of different kinds right. of products and that helps the bottom line to work. And, and I think there can be potentially a good in that because maybe some people find their way into your store who don't think of themselves as book people. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I mean, that's one way of thinking about this, the business model and Seminary Co-op thinks about it in a really different way. So can you talk about how Seminary Co-op has evolved 
uh, and how you have evolved with thinking about like what kind of bookstore you want to do, what kind of model you want to do, and and where that led you. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the store itself. So it's founded in 1961. It was founded by seminary students who uh, came together to get obscure books cheaply. It then grew in the 70s, 80s, and 90s into this huge academic bookstore with a global reputation and anyone who was anyone who came through Chicago would join but also everyone within the community would join it was literally I think it was 78,000 uh, shareholders in this member-owned co-op when we became a nonprofit, um, and that was two years ago that we became a nonprofit. And we just recognized that the notion of a member-owned co-op, as charming as it is, um, was so dysfunctional. No one cared about you know, governance and policy and bylaws and, and meetings. And, and when we were losing money, no one was going to pony up and say, well, 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 we'll make sure we can keep this thing afloat. It was more like, what can you do for me and how can you get me discounts? And we said, no, 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 this is too important. We can't like mess with the governance in that way. And we really, it really should be unowned in some way or should be owned by the public. And so we moved to this not-for-profit model after years and years and years of talking to the community and helping, you know, assure them that it wasn't going to be uh, the destruction of the store that they love. One of the things that they loved was that it's just books. Uh, we have at the co-op itself, it's 99.9% .9 books. I agree with you. I spent a lot of time in your store. I love your store. <laughs> We've talked about like sidelines and some of the things that right. you sell and you bring in like big stacks of books and like really just, you know, you know, like you're gambling on these are the, you know, the thousand books I'm going to gamble on right now. And it's great. And you do a great job with it. And I feel like that model is so powerful, but then you also cut your teeth at one of, as far as I'm concerned, one of Manhattan's great, great bookstores, which is Three Lives, which is essentially it's books. And again, like you gamble, it gambled on those books and those books were so, it's so smart. It's a great store. And the idea that you can sell just books in Manhattan, with Manhattan real estate, it's crazy. Uh, and, and somehow it works. Uh, but those, yeah. it's really hard to do that. And the idea that we can have for our, our store has a hundred thousand books on the shelf, mostly academic and scholarly or quote unquote serious books, which, you know, doesn't mean that they're good it means that they're serious and they're like they have that model there are plenty uh -huh. of bad ones it's not a snobby thing it's just like a statement <laughs> scholarly, of fact. Right. yeah right it's just scholarly and um and the, and those have even a lower margin than the books that you know um like you know ross gay and sadie smith behind you like those are those um uh great books by the way and that ross gay is really oh a special gosh. book all-time favorite yeah sorry I'm getting, I'm getting excited <laughs> right. about ross gay. Uh, but, but anyway the, so those models, the academic yeah. press book publishing model is even even more difficult, even tighter margins than a sort of mainstream right. book publishing model. So if you're focusing on that, how do you make that work? Exactly. And one of this is recognition that we're not at, we're not in it as retailers. We're not in it to make money on buying and selling. We're in it because of the cultural work that happens in those spaces. Otherwise, if it was just buying and selling, we'd buy and sell things that were actually profitable. Um, <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's really the argument, if there is one, is let's build a model that supports the things that we love about these stores and not forcing us to make decisions that we might not want to make. If we do want to make them, great. If it's a curatorial decision, and again, you have impeccable taste uh, in the gifts, and like that's great, but we shouldn't have to. Right. Yeah. And I, I love that thinking about, you know, we're, we're not in this purely to make a profit. And I think that's got to be true of every bookstore owner to one degree or another. I mean, if you if you wanted to get rich, this isn't the business you went into. I mean, I've heard mm -hmm. one bookseller describe us as not just for profits, some of us. <laughs> um, and there was, right. a, there was a book about independent booksellers called Reluctant Capitalists. So That's I right. think, I think there's right. a pretty common acceptance that like, you don't do this to get rich. But at the same time, I loved where you quoted in your book, um, Toni Morrison, and she's talking about artists, but comparing mm -hmm. it to booksellers. And, and she says something along the lines of the problem is that artists are really resilient. Um, mm -hmm. So you come to accept that like, well, you'll just make it work somehow or exactly. other, and that becomes normalized. I think that's, that's certainly the case in the, in the situations where we are able to make it work. There's a sense of like, well, great, that's, that's wonderful. You're, you must be doing fine when it's like, mm. should it be this difficult just to make a living selling these things that are sort of necessary for the soul? So, mm. I mean, are those some of the conversations you've been having with with other booksellers and within seminary co-op and how do you answer those questions? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I think that's right. And I think that um, booksellers in general are, are incredibly modest and uh, which is wonderful. Um, and that modesty has ha had the result that, you know, Tony Morrison warns, warns against and that I think for all of us that we're saying, hey, wait a minute, we are, like, we are doing such 
good, important work. And none of us want to get up there and say that because so many people are, and we don't want, and so many people are underpaid and all that and to get up there and say, oh, we're underpaid. I mean, it's like, it's a silly thing to do out loud. And a lot of what I've been doing is, you know, talking, I mean, I'm talking actual numbers of here, here's what, what it means to us when we say we're underpaid, what it means to us to not be on a professional track. And those numbers, I think are, are incredibly powerful. And even outside of, you know, New York or San Francisco or places that are, are expensive to live. Um, but, I, you know, I think about, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on this, if you don't mind sharing. I have only ever run other people's bookstores. I've run established bookstores, right? So I've been at Stanford, I was at Berkeley, established stores, campus stores, and then the seminary co-op is, you know, uh, whatever, 15 years older than I am. And, and you, however, after working in stores that you didn't, find, like you founded your own bookstore in Brooklyn, which is like, so hard it's so hard and I'd, lo I'd love to hear a little bit about how that experience was for you and that decision to kind of do your own thing and build a store uh in in brooklyn of all places and then open a second store um yeah i mean it all seems a little bit like unlikely in retrospect we're like wait how how did we pull that off but i i mean i you know i i was lucky enough to have a, a mentor who who got me into bookstores um and you know, tried to work in publishing for a little bit, but was like, wait, this is actually the only thing I love doing with my life. I mean, I think that you know, hearing you talk about bookstores and and faith together, I think for a lot of people, bookselling is really kind of like a calling. It's you mm -hmm. know, you're like, this is just what I have to do. It's just like being a, a writer or any kind of kind of art. Um, so it's like, how do how do I make a living doing this? And it didn't seem feasible to make a living just working in a bookstore, which is one of the problems. So oh, I was like, problems. if this is going to be a life, like a career, then I'm going to have to own my own place and I'm going to have to start my own place. And it it was a time when Brooklyn was getting this reputation as like a literary mecca for, for authors, but there just weren't that many bookstores in Brooklyn. And I had worked at some really successful bookstores at McNally Jackson mm -hmm. and at Three Lives and at... Um, book culture back when it was labyrinth and I I knew despite the sort of prevailing wisdom of the time that like it was possible to make yeah. a profitable bookstore not guaranteed <laughs> but uh -huh. but possible um so I mean I had so many amazing mentors in the book industry in sort of the Brooklyn business industry this community in Fort Green Clinton Hill was incredibly supportive and was actively seeking a bookstore so a lot of factors had to come together to make this possible right. um but I feel like I was actually at the beginning of this happening in a lot of different places of communities saying, hey, we need a bookstore. How can we partner with, with someone who wants to open a bookstore? And people sort of getting a professional education and, and opening a bookstore like with open eyes about what the business model was. Like right. maybe there was an era when you could sort of just do it as like a little hobby, but like that clearly has not been the case for a really long time. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, and I like I partnered with Rebecca Fitting, who you know really well, um, who also mm -hmm. had a ton of you know curational experience in bookstores, um, and we got some community funding, but, and we got a lot of mentorship from the ABA, the American Booksellers Association, who you know coached us on all of those numbers and business models and break-even numbers, and and we had to, but like I, one of the things that's so difficult is opening a retail space takes so much money up front, so we. Right. The, the fundraising was like such a huge part of it. Um, right. And we were really lucky to have this community lender model and people in the community kind of came together to, to raise that startup capital. Um, yeah, it was like a fairy tale. Um, but really and, lucky, you say really lucky, but like, isn't it the community, isn't the community better off for having your store and your stores now? And isn't that like, I, I almost feel like, again, this is where we all get, we get so apologetic about it. It's like, no, we, the community should be supporting this. They should be paying for it. It is not, you're not doing it for the money. You're doing it to create this right. space and what you've done. Like that neighborhood is different because, and, and more valuable too, separate, separate from, you know, the cultural value. That's incredible. Like that should be the conversation we're having uh, all the time. And I just, you know, hats off to you for, for pulling it <laughs> off. Um, and, you know, I hope it you know, lives for generations. I mean, these, this is the kind of thing that we're really pushing for is that this is not an individual endeavor. It's a community endeavor and we should all be booksellers in some way. Yeah. I mean, I love the way that you split the book up uh, is into chapters. There's um, val I, I'm not getting them in the right order, but it's value, community, time, space um is there one other one abundance abundance yes <laughs> and i was like our business models are so different but those are exactly the exactly. core things that we right. care about and right. i think the idea of community and the idea of value like what is important to you and how much is it worth um have gone into both the formation and the continuation the evolution of seminary co-op 
and how Greenlight Bookstore has evolved too. Mm -hmm. So how did you how did you manage to distill everything that's important about bookstores into those five concepts? Like, what was that process like? Yeah, um, I the, the value question is really interesting because we um, we talk about value and we talk about market value and things like that, and, and, and some some level it makes a lot of sense to us and we feel completely logical when we make these economic decisions, and then on some level it is completely irrational. Like the things that matter most to us, we all know are things that are have absolutely no monetary value. They can't be measured. They can't be quantified. They're all qualitative, and it's things like love or beauty or awe or suffering or justice. I mean, these are not, uh, uh, you know, anything you can quantify. Uh, and so ultimately we're playing this game where everything is worth money and, uh, you know, and can be quantified, but the things that we're trying to achieve by uh, getting, you know, making money or making time or whatever, they really can't, can't be. Um, and I, as, as a reader, I, I just read a lot about these things. I mean, I, I happen to like I love uh, philosophy and poetry and, and religion. They want to read the book. We'll see those, those in there in literature, things like that. Um, and, you know, the things that are, that come out of those books and come out of a you know, lifetime of thinking about those things and, and the, you know, the Jewish heritage and all of that, these are not things that um, are necessarily uh, quantifiable. Uh, and there are these moments that, that occur that you know, dilated are the, the single most important moments in your life, the, the epiphanies that happen in a novel, right? Things like that. Um, anyway, so I, I think that all of that is, is really important. I wouldn't have articulated any of it. I wasn't thinking about what it means to be a bookseller. I don't like sit around and like, you know, navel gaze about like, oh, this noble profession, like all of us, I'm just working a lot in the store and I'm hauling boxes and helping customers and, and you know, excited about the new book coming out and doing, making my curatorial decisions and all that. Um, but the Seminary Co-op, which is a store I've loved, as, as I read from the, in the introduction, since 1994, when I first saw it, and also the year I first became a bookseller, and also the year that Amazon started, coincidentally, it was under threat. The store was about to go out of business. And frankly, it's been under threat. I took over in 2014 and there hasn't been a year that's gone by where I've been like, oh, we're good. We made We're it. Fine. Everything's yeah, good. Like it's just, <laughs> yeah. a, it's like, Never. it's, it's a hustle. I mean, it's a hustle. Like we're just trying to make it work every day. And at some point, because the store is established, because it's already an existing argument on behalf of itself, I just thought, boy, like so many people love this place. I get religious letters. I get, le I mean, I basically am like a minister, whatever, like people are <laughs> sending me things where they're like, they just love the, the, the services and the temple and the, like whatever, it, you know, whatever religious language they use people love it. it it means so much to them and so i didn't i no longer thought that i had some romantic notion of what these stores were i realized that there were thousands of people that felt this way and if i could only articulate and reflect back to them what i was hearing and you'll see a lot in the book there are a lot of uh, i'll even quote from like letters i get from members and i have a librarian in the community who thinks about kindness and what it means to walk around kindness as this beautiful formulation and you know it's right there next to petrarch and right there next to the talmudic you know some of the rabbis and i mean they're all just hanging out in one spot like they do in a bookstore which yes. is what happens in our space yes, the proximity. And, I love right mm -hmm. the proximity and then like, it's, everyone's coeval with each other right and suddenly yep. like time flattens and you're just surrounded by people from throughout the ages and someone from across the street you know and it's just great right. it's just great Oh my gosh. I remember the first day I worked at three lives. I was supposed to shelf some books and I started with the A's and I was like, Jane Austen, Paul Auster, they're right next to each other. I was like, those people would never talk to each other, but here they are talk, right. in, in conversation because they're on the shelf. I mean, and that happens, it happens with the books, the conversations between the books, but it also happens with the humans in the space, mm -hmm. like being in that space together creates a certain kind of interaction, a certain kind of conversation. I, I've been struggling for years to write Greenlight's mission statement, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm okay. almost there, but, but it always involves the idea of creating a welcoming space. Um, and I, so I wanna hear you talk about space. And of course, space and time are connected. You're creating a space mm -hmm. where time doesn't work the same way. But yeah. can you talk a little bit more about the space part and, yeah. and why bookstore spaces are special? Absolutely. Um, one of the conclusions that I came to about uh, maybe five years ago or so is that in the 21st century, no reader needs a bookstore to buy books and no bookstore except for three lives can make a living selling new books alone that might be the only store maybe that maybe there are a dozen of them i don't know <laughs> um uh and and so then do we even need bookstores in the 21st century and if so why and uh because we've been retailers and we've inherited that model it, it felt really important to say it's not because we're retailers it's not buying and selling really what our product is if we can call it a product 
is the browsing experience. It's the physical space that's created where people come in and they spend time and community um, you know, comes together uh, you know, on behalf of that browse and literary endeavor and uh, the thinking that happens in that space. And that there's something about that experience that is so valuable that any community that wants it should have it. And thinking about actually working at, you, you worked at Labyrinth, which became Book Culture, which is, uh, which is a Columbia University for the viewers who don't know. And I don't know if uh, you, you know, I don't know if you know this, Jessica. So Columbia University actually courted my uh, my predecessor, Jack Sella, oh, to wow. run the store. There's a really great article. Uh, huh. I think it's in the '90s where they wanted the provost wanted a seminary co-op at Columbia University. Now that provost would not have even conceived of a store like that without having spent time at the University of Chicago and then went to Jack Seller, who was my predecessor, and said, hey, can you open a store? And he's like, I can barely run this store. I'm not going to go like <laughs> a store, you know, like, uh, in, in New York, uh, which I, I appreciate. Um, yeah, and then, we, you know, I feel like you must get asked that, that all the time. We get that too. It's like, can't you open a store here, a store there? It's like, you have no idea what you're asking. <laughs> right. And you're asking exactly the right question. Like Columbia, they're heroic for asking that question mm -hmm. and they're keeping that store going. I mean, it's heroic yeah. and we should, and, but we need a professional class of booksellers to do it. They're like, yeah, go ahead. And like, there are 10 of us who are, who are able to run, you know, academic bookstores. No, we can't, like, we need a new class. And that part is part of what uh, we're trying to do is say, there is a profession here that's so important that builds these mm -hmm. spaces that are so important, not just for academics, but for communities. And, uh, and to think about ways to build that and support it where we're not apologizing for the wise inefficiencies that we, uh, you know, are, are required to do our work, but we are, you know, acknowledging that there are cultural, there's cultural work that needs to happen and a profession that needs to be built. And one should not need to become an owner to even have a chance at it. And by a chance at it, it's like you probably work, you know, 100 hours a week in a good week. And then, you know, and you have the stress that comes with it and all of that, like, you know, being a small business owner and, and a, a, you know, an inefficient business. Uh, and at some point, like, we need to have a stronger model that is just a little bit closer to the professions. Um, yeah. The other thing I'll say about space, and I just want to mm -hmm. call this out because I want to, I want to ask you about this. Um, so we're, we're both sitting in a portion of our home libraries. Yours is much bigger than, than what you're sitting in front of as a client because we're booksellers. We have books everywhere. Um, I have an alphabetical, this is my poetry section. It's an alphabetical A to Z. You okay. have my publisher behind you, and uh, which is wonderful. And one this of the things I write, you got yeah. the New York Review of Books, it's gorgeous. You got the Library of America poetry, yeah. it's gorgeous. <laughs> And one of the things that comes up, and I'd love to hear your, your perspective on this and how you, you shelve. So in the space section, I talk about adjacencies and the way in which mm -hmm. a browsing experience is also about like, you know, Jane Austen and Paul Auster sitting, sitting together. Um, talk a little bit about how you've thought about kind of setting your store up and creating what I, what I write about is the browsage, uh, but the, you know, where the books sit on the shelf. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, that's a conversation that's always ongoing. It's never like we get to a point where we're like, all right, just like this forever always mm -hmm. it's going to stay this way and i mean that's one of the things that i that you talked about also that's that's so important but i mean one of the unique things about greenlight is that we shelve all fiction together regardless of genre because we felt like there are so many books that are a mystery but it's a literary mystery right. or fantasy but it's a literary fantasy but what if, when do you take the fantasy and you're like this isn't literary and it felt like we like ghettoizing genres was was just arbitrary um and so we shelve all of the fiction together. Um, and sometimes people get mad at us for that because they're like, but I just read <laughs> mysteries, where are the mysteries? So we balance that out with having featured displays all the time. And I know that's, I, I don't know how much you guys do with sort of like table displays. You talk about the front table, which is actually like a great conversation. Like those books that are sort of like, we have the new and notable tables out front, but we also have like our seasonal, you know, we have Arab, Amer Arab American Heritage Month is like a display right now, but we also have like the Black Voices table or mm -hmm. the like Beach Reads table or whatever it is that that's sort of like highlighting things and putting them together and juxtaposing them in a different way. So talk about the front table. I love that part. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we love having uh, incredibly, obs not obscure, but like broad categories like you do with, with literature. Um, and so we don't do too much around uh, particular themes. Uh, it really is just like, you know, literary nonfiction and then it can sure. be something you know like you know a, a new Loeb edition of you know Aristotle's criticism like literary criticism uh, alongside the new Paul Auster nonfiction um, and that that again creating interesting adjacencies is so important um, and we'll throw occasionally we'll throw poetry on the front table we'll, yeah. we'll and we'll put the you know, ancient books and, and modern books there and mm -hmm. trying to just show the the breadth of conversation that 
once you know that's that is exciting they're like oh let me go see what's going on in the history section and then you get to see the depth of it and that uh for us with a hundred thousand volumes and a ton of space is one of the great joys of being in a store like this and in a much smaller store you've got a lot of decisions to make uh, around what you can and can't keep on the shelf and something that i guess, I guess is, is an important difference for us compared to a lot of bookstores is we uh you know what's known as backlist which are old, older titles and two you know a year or two older uh, uh or more that is really what we love and care about. So we have, um, I think it's something like 16, now it's like 16 bookcases of philosophy. Uh, after the pandemic, like pre-pandemic, it was like about 25. And when I go into a bookstore and I see three bookcases of philosophy, I'm thrilled. Yeah. And like the idea that we can have 16 cases of philosophy and there's like you know, two shelves of Montaigne and a full case of Plato. And it's like, it's just wonderful. And the books sell. Yeah. And, uh, and I have no doubt, you know, there are stores in Brooklyn and Manhattan, I mean, wherever that could sell these kinds of books if they were just out there um, and and were discoverable. And that is the thing that we can do that is really unparalleled. Yeah, I mean, and I, one of the things that I love about bookstores is that everyone is so different, that there isn't, mm -hmm. you know, the, the organization is different, the emphasis is different. I mean, we have a poetry section that has continued to grow because we had a poetry series with a really great curator and it just, and, and people bought books at the events mm -hmm. and, then, and then they came back for poetry. And so, and it's, I feel like that it's sort of unusual to sell a lot of poetry. Philosophy we found got stolen a lot. So we don't do as much <laughs> philosophy as we used to. I was like, must be poor students who, I don't know what, what the story was. Um, but, but I love that you found that audience and that they've found you. I mean, you might like a seminary co must, must be a destination for philosophy at this point, um, which is fantastic. So, um, I mean, one of the things I loved in the book, I, and this is super nerdy, is like all the statistics, um, mm -hmm. all, all the numbers. I mean, the numbers mm -hmm. about the book industry in general, but also the numbers about your store, like how many of the titles you sold last year were a book that you sold one copy. And right. that's really unique and really special. Can you talk about some of the some of the facts and figures and like how those how those are serving what you're trying to say? Yeah, I, I wonder how you how you I wonder if that is a unique number. I think I think you're right that it is. Um, so uh, the number you're referring to is we, we sold 28,000 titles uh, in 2019. It was the last full year of, uh, of being open before the pandemic. And of those 16,000 were individual copies. So you know, more than well over 50 percent were one book to one customer for the entire year. And oftentimes we'd restock that book and it might not sell for another year or two, but it would sell. And, and the notion and you know, the American Booksellers Association, who you and I both work very closely with, uh, who gives us a lot, of, you know, a lot of numbers and a lot of help and a lot of advice based on those numbers, they don't run those numbers. And I'd be very curious to see how other stores do with that. And what would it mean to make a business case even? And I don't mean a business case that these are necessarily profitable sales because they sell slowly and that's not a good retail idea, but that these books will find their audience if they're sitting on a shelf. And we, we happen to have, uh, I think, the best um, university press distributor, which is Chicago Distribution Center, right. about three miles south of us. Yeah. And they and I've walked their warehouse. It's amazing. It is so like Raiders of the Lost Ark. You see like these incredible, you know, boxes and boxes and boxes of books. And you just, you just know there's magic in, in, in every one of those pallets. Uh, and I, I think, well, why aren't those books just sitting on our shelves? Like, why, why are they sitting there? People can wander our, our shelves and find them. And there's a business case to be made for it. And so part of us, even like the nonprofit model for us is saying, what for publishers even, what is the point of a bookstore for you? If, if you know, Amazon is the largest bookseller by far or seller of books by far in the country. And they're not booksellers in the sense that they think about our community and the ecosystem and the work that it takes to, to do this, but they're the ones that are selling directly maybe. Okay, great. What then does the uh, bookstore do? What can it do? How can it support dis the discovery of titles? How can it support authors and author relationships? How can it support young scholars who are thinking about what they want to do with their career? Uh, like all of these ideas, and how can it support communities in terms of bringing a literary voice to that community? And all of those ideas are, are, are on some level obvious to anyone who knows our store or your store, because we make our, our case by dint of our existence. That alone is enough to make our case. And then we can step back and say, okay, well, let's figure out the financing of it because there's no question that these are, um, you know, incredibly valuable institutions, and they aren't—they uh, aren't as common as they could or should be. There are plenty of communities that would love a bookstore, that would support a bookstore, um, but there isn't a model for that retail establishment. Yeah, um, 
I have a couple more questions for you, but I want to encourage folks to drop your questions in the Q and A if you have questions for Jeff. Um, I, I feel like on your tour, you've gotten to talk to folks who have a variety of business models. I mean, you talked to Danny Kane at Raven Bookstore, mm -hmm. who just changed up the ownership of their store. Um, so, I mean, do, do you think that every bookstore should be a nonprofit, or <laughs> what are what are some of the alternative models that you think we should be thinking about? going right, forward. Right. No, I definitely don't think every bookstore <laughs> should be a nonprofit. And we're not a nonprofit. Um, so we're not a 501c3. Uh, we're established as a nonprofit. And we're the first and only not-for-profit bookstore in the country whose mission is book selling. There are plenty of really good nonprofits. There's a great one in Chicago called Open Books. Housing Works in New York is wonderful. Um, then there are some amazing legacy bookstores like City Lights and Kepler's both in the Bay Area um, and many, many more. St. Louis uh, has a Left Bank Books, which is wonderful, where half of the store is, a for, well, the store is a for-profit model. And then the events programming is a nonprofit model. And, they, uh, and the argument there is that you know, at open books, literacy is the is the cause. Ho housing works. It's um, you know uh, services um, for uh, Kepler's. It's you know literary uh, you know education or, or or things like that. Um, and that the, the sale of books supports those noble causes. And our argument is that the noble cause itself is is the bookstore. It is the browse. And we're trying to find a way to make to make that case without having it be you know about a tax shelter or uh, IRS designations, but really uh, just an establishment of the model. There are bookstores that have become B Corps that I think is a really interesting model. Um, but what, what I worry about with all of our models, including ours, is that it will always be, well, what else can you do besides book selling in order to make it work? That's always been, it's been what we've been doing for years. And that's the wrong question. Any step away from book selling is a step in the wrong direction. What we do is book selling. And so when we create something around literacy or you know, um, what it means, somebody was trying to do something around author relationships and, and development of manuscripts, like, great, there are so many amazing people doing that work. We are really good at book selling. Why not just find a way for there to be proper remuneration for the work that we're already doing so well? Yeah. And if you can't, like, if you can't actually, if there isn't a functional business model, then something is wrong. It's not like, that. yeah, right. I, I, I know what you mean. And I, it's interesting. I think I, you may have gone to this as well, although we didn't cross paths a couple of weeks ago, there was, um, or months ago, there was a, an online forum called Reimagining Bookstores of Praveen Manan and a couple other folks were Absolutely. involved in. Um, and I remember ending up in a, in a breakout room with an author who I know, and he was like, wait, I'm confused because I, I've, you and I have talked about this before. And like, I thought that bookstores were doing well and more bookstores were opening. I was like, that is true. You're not wrong. The bookstores aren't necessarily dying, but we've realized that none of us can make a living. Exactly. <laughs> Especially the booksellers. Um, right. And that's, you know, there's a lot of conversation happening in our industry. There's, you know, booksellers forming unions or, you know, talking about cooperative ownership or other kinds of mm -hmm. things. Cause it's like, how can you be doing this work, which is really professional work yep. and not be able to make ends meet. I mean, and I think, that's right. you know, possibly bookselling is not the only profession where this is an issue. So <laughs> maybe it's right. a, maybe it's an even bigger problem, but, right. but there, but yeah, I yeah, mean, that's true. It's not the only, it's not the only profession where it's an issue, but what we're talking about, I mean, and booksellers unionizing is, you know, is a great thing. And, and um, there are like they're unionizing so that they can make, I mean, right now we're paying $15 and 25 cents in Chicago uh, for booksellers. And we are something like 80% above the national average for bookseller pay. And the minimum wage in Chicago is $15. We're not doing it because we're so generous and we lose a lot of money. We lose a lot of money by paying and we pay so little and it's still above the average. So really in thinking about for the audience, like what a librarian makes, what a pub, what someone in publishing makes, like, yeah, they're all pitiful, but we just want to be that pitiful. Like we, we want right. to get up to that level <laughs> and, that, and that's it. And I think that you mentioned the reimagining bookstores movement, which Praveen Madan, who runs Kepler's, who is stewarding those stores after they almost went out of business twice. And the third time he's, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to help support this for a while and then step away. And he's a total hero about this. It's wonderful. Nothing has given me more hope in my, in the 25 years of my career than that session that we were in where 600 booksellers, publishers, authors, community members, philanthropists came together and said, the model is broken, how do we fix it? And that was the beginning of a large conversation that I can't wait to see what comes of it, but that is exactly the conversation we need to have. We need to be honest about the fact that it's broken. And if we wanna keep these things going, we have to come up with a solution that will be relevant in 2030, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not about getting through the next couple of years. Right. 
And it may not be a single solution. I mean, I think exactly. there's, you know, potentially a heterodoxy, exactly. a multiplicity exactly. of solutions. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. so um, I, we have a couple audience questions and, and a lot of folks just like loving on your book, um, which we can also talk about. But I, I wanted to ask one more. Um, when I started reading the introduction to your book, you mentioned like a couple of different um, laments about the state of bookstores, which, and they go pretty far back. They go, mm -hmm. I think the earliest one was maybe in the 1600s. Like, isn't it too bad bookstores are dying? And I was mm -hmm. like, this is, and I, like, I've been saying this for years. It's like, you keep saying that bookstores are dying and somehow <laughs> we're still here. So right. how do you, how do you think about this book as, as part of that tradition or as, different from that tradition in terms of like it's so it's too bad bookstores aren't what they yeah. used to be how do you no, how do you how no. are you in relation to those laments thank you for that it, <laughs> i couldn't it couldn't be more different um and I, I i call it out to say this is not what this is about um you know the book selling is no longer worth anything that the book trade is no longer going well this is the, the i think the quote that you were referring to um I am not interested in lamentation at all. And I think one of the most important qualities of a bookseller, of any bookseller, is their enthusiasm. And to me, the enthusiasm and the, the, the ideas and the generation of those ideas, like that is what's important. And that's what I think we're really good at. We usually focus it on single titles. And I can sell you Ross Gay's Book of Delights um, because you know it's, it's a phenomenal book, but we don't articulate what's so great about the stores. And so I didn't want to write a lamentation. I wanted to write a celebration. It's in praise of, it's not a critique. Um, you know, there are you know, arguments uh, here and there about what models could work or couldn't, but it's really not, it's not a critique and it's not an argument. It, it was really meant to help a reader, an average reader, remember what they love about being in book spaces if they haven't been in a while or articulate what they love about them if they are lucky enough to have a really good bookstore like yours or a really great library or a really great personal library at home and what that actually does for the interior landscape of a human. Yeah, and it's a great moment to have that reminder because a lot of stores are just now being able to offer those spaces again after right. not being able to for, totally. for such a long time. And you know, this, those stores did have that resilience, they managed to get through it. But but uh, of course, a lot was lost when we couldn't be in bookstores together. And and it's a great time to go back. So if you haven't been to your local bookstore lately, go in mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. be in that space and that, that different kind of time. Um, Okay, so we've got a couple of uh, some some comments, which is always <laughs> great too. Um, Joseph Rosenblum was pointing out another um, nonprofit, like one of the ones you talked about, Bookmarks in Winston Salem, which I think is sort of a literary nonprofit. Um, but he also um, noted your distinction between worth and value. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that distinction. Yeah, and, and thanks for calling out Bookmarks. That, that is one of the really these are all like great models, um, and they are five hundred one c three, and so. Uh, the IRS currently does not have a designation for a bookstore whose mission is book selling that could be a 501c3. And I think there's an interesting conversation about would that make sense if we did it. Um, but yeah, Bookmarks is, is a great example. Um, you know, the idea around value and worth is, is really rec is recognizing, again, the inability to, to quantify the things that matter most. And um, I, I call on uh, an author I love so much, uh, Robert Musil, who uh, wrote a, a great novel called The Man Without Qualities, um, but also has written some wonderful nonfiction, actually, uh, University of Chicago Press publishes. And in it, he talks about the difference between like, like mor morality and what morality is, um, you know, thinking about like these replicable things versus like a truly ethical experience and the difference between those two ideas of this is something that's repeatable that I could do better or differently next time I can make that decision versus you know an ethical conversation around love or introspection or humility like these concepts that are really not measurable um, that is to me an incredibly important distinction and the idea of value and worth which comes out of the idea of the gift and what it means to have a commodity versus a gift and what it means to make something and give it to someone as opposed to have a trinket that uh, is is replicable those are important distinctions that have an intellectual weight to them is not just this uh you know idea of like this romantic notion of what it means to well, forget the markets and forget, you know, capitalism and all this, like all the, the arguments that I think are, you know, important, but there, there's something that's nuanced about this that I just found to be incredibly powerful. Uh, and I also in that chapter, and th thank you for that question, because one of the things that was important to me was also to say, this isn't a, a this isn't a pie in the sky idea. There are already existing models like this, um, uh, by which I mean models that are 
completely different from how we think about it, where value and worth are separated and are thought about differently. I talk about a model that comes from you know, the Orthodox Jewish world. It's the Sachar Zvulan partnership where the merchants are not as important as the scholars. And so they make a lot more money, but in order to live a more meaningful life, they give that money to support the scholars who spend their days studying because the merchants are not able, like they're not able to live a good enough life in that way. And so they have to do this to support it. It's a really, it's, an, it's a complete inversion of how we think about those things. And, and things like the Institute for Advanced Study, which started at Princeton and now exists at a number of universities, it just says, you're not here to do anything useful. We don't need you to create anything that can be used. Uh, these are to you know, great scientists and thinkers. What we want you to do is just sit around with your, you know, your chin in your hands and just think all day. And whatever you come up with, we trust that you're going to come up with something that will be worth your coming up with. And that's enough. Uh, and it doesn't have to result in, it doesn't have to yield anything. It doesn't have to result in a particular um, you know, outcome. It, it is enough to have the inquiry and the pursuit of useless knowledge is actually, it's an end in itself. It's, it's just fine. Uh, so it's so really sharing like, these kinds of models and this articulation of how we could do it differently uh, if we thought about it differently. And uh, yeah, so. Right, sometimes I'm like, maybe just universal basic income and then people can pursue what they need to pursue. <laughs> that's a, that's a, a different and larger conversation, but thanks for talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, this, I have to read this whole note from Ruth Catcher in Brooklyn. She says, Jeff, I wanted to say hi, though we've never met. I worked at Seminary Co-op on 57th Street Books in the late 80s and was the children's book buyer at 57th Street for a few years. I eventually moved to New York City to go into children's publishing and was succeeded as children's buyer Amazing. by Franny Billingsley. Greenlight is my neighborhood bookstore, but Seminary Co-op formed me. And the five years mm -hmm. I worked there were so important. And she adds, I'm very much looking forward to reading your book. That's amazing. Well, uh, thank you for that. And I look forward to meeting you at some point, whether in uh, Chicago or New York. And you call up Franny Billingsley. Um, so I am one of three right now, I think, authors on staff. I'm suddenly an author, but I have two other people on staff who uh, uh, are authors. And Franny Billingsley is a children's author who um, wrote a book called Chime that was a National Book Award finalist. She's absolutely wonderful. She's written five books now, I think. Um, and... We also have uh, August Clark, who's a, a young adult uh, fantasy writer who is brilliant and has a really bright future uh, you know, ahead of him. And there's going to be uh, like this idea that you are uh, you know, a bookseller and, and stick with it um, and not part of the literary world, I think, I think is interesting uh, and wrong. Uh, we also have editors at you know, Columbia University Press. There's an editor who used to run the front table. We've got faculty throughout uh, University of Chicago who've worked at the stores. We have Taihim Bajess, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, uh, worked at the store. So it's a, it's a really an incredible place to cut your teeth. But if you stick with it, and Franny is still with us and worked with you in the 90s, uh, it's also an incredible place to grow a career. I love that. And yeah, I, we've had a lot of folks from Greenlight who have gone on to other sort of book related careers as well. I, I think everyone in publishing should work at a bookstore <laughs> at some point and like know what happens to their books, like as they meet the reader. I feel like, I, and I'll talk about that to Absolutely. anyone who wants to listen to it but um but I love I love that connection that was really cool Absolutely. so Cindy asks um what were some of your favorite books when you were growing up I have some more questions along those lines but talk about your favorite yeah. books well I was a terrible 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 reader I hated reading so much uh, my mom would love to tell you how the first thing I do when she tried to sell me on a book was see how long it was. And if it was over 200 pages, I wouldn't touch it. Um, <laughs> it took me a long time to get into reading and it was really her influence that got me there. And she just was relentless. Um, the two books that stand out to me, and it was, it was soon after I started reading. So when I was around maybe 15, 16, um, one of them was uh, Emerson's essays, uh, which I read uh, with great delight and I, I read them when I was 15 but then I reread them when I was 25 and I reread them you know two months ago and yesterday I mean they're just incredible and uh, I, I felt really lucky to stumble upon those and then I read um, I don't know what it was maybe 10 or 12 of my mom's James Baldwin uh, books both the fiction and nonfiction. but I really loved the fiction then uh, and a book tell me how long the train's been gone uh, stands out to me um, which I read uh, I think I must have been I was a little bit older uh, but the first one I read was Giovanni's Room of All Things, and I just loved it so much. I loved the feel of it. I loved the language of it. Uh, and it was just, it was something that was so far removed from my world. Uh, whereas like Go Tell on the Mountain was actually like really close to my world in some way um, because of, you know, the like the way that religion right. infuses that book. Yeah. Um, and I just felt like 
as someone who grew up in basically in uh, like an Eastern European shtetl environment, uh, and I say that with great love, uh, it, it brought me into these worlds that I just didn't know existed. And these ideas like Emerson's, or those, that's still a book by which I, I hope to live a life. I mean, it's still a book that um, it feels like I can, you know, put it alongside Ecclesiastes as one of the great wisdom books. And, um, and that feels, uh, you know, incredible. So, um, yeah, those are a few of them. I, I can go on, uh, but I'll tell you, I, I, re I read so little when I was a kid. I hated reading. So it was like Mad Magazine and, you know, comic, you know, Bloom County and stuff like that. That was basically like, that was about it. You know. But you came to it. You came to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm making up for lost time. It's like awesome. bacon. I made up for lost time on, on the bacon question, too, but that's for a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to ask you to do a little more, a little more hand selling. Um, I feel like, like all really good books, this one made me want to read other books. And there's so many authors that you quote from in there. Um, I was like making, like scribbling my notes. I'm like, I need to reread Christopher Morley. I need to reread Gabriel Zaid and mm -hmm. Calvin and Hyde and um, Borges, obviously, is like all over the place in there. But um, I wonder what you'd recommend to someone who's like not a professional bookseller, mm -hmm. but who wants to think about some of these ideas about like space and time and value and how books connect, connect us to those. What are the, some of the ones that you'd recommend and so give us, yeah. give us your hand. So thanks. All right. I get to be a bookseller. All right, this is good. <laughs> um, well, I think if for someone who is not, um, who just loves reading and loves reading about reading and books. There's no one better than Elizabeth Hardwick. And actually you've got those New York reviews behind you and New York review of books have been uh, reissuing first her, um, I think it was her published essays and then her uncollected essays just came out and they're absolutely fantastic. Um, I would also recommend Lydia Davis's uh, collections. Uh, there's two of them now of essays. Her fiction's wonderful too, but the essays um, to, for people who just want to read about books in ways that kind of shake up your idea about what it, it means to write about reading and about authors. Um, if you want to read about books, there really is no one better than Borges, you mentioned, um, who doesn't come out. And none of these, neither of these are like professional book selling things. Um, you mentioned Reluctant Capitalist by Laura Miller. That's a great book on book selling. But I, I personally don't, I, I don't read a ton of those books, actually. Um, I, like I love reading about book spaces. Um, so Borges is, is um, obsessed with books, book spaces. He was the director of the National Library in Buenos Aires uh, and was a poet and an essayist and a short story writer. And those short stories are, they're all phenomenal. Um, but then also he went blind like many, uh, like many, like two uh, directors of that National Library before him is this tradition of going blind in that role. And it's strange. Um, and he has this gorgeous poem uh, called Gift where he takes over as the director of the National Library. And the moment he has all of these books in front of him, he also loses his sight. And it's this powerful, sublime short poem about what it means to be gifted these books and, and the dark simultaneously. Um, one of the things that he then did was he would go to his local bookstore and ask young booksellers to, if they had time to, you know, he'd pay them to come and, and read to him because he couldn't read anymore. One of those booksellers was someone named Alberto Manguel, who wrote, uh, literally wrote the book on reading. It's the history of reading. Uh, I, I read it you know, 25 years ago and loved it. Um, and then he actually became the director of the National Library in Buenos Aires, uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, and wrote a book called Packing My Library uh, that Yale University Press put out. And it is absolutely wonderful. So is History of Reading. So is Labyrinth by Borges or the collected poems. Penguin has a three volume, uh, more or less complete uh, uh, collection, Elizabeth Hardwick and uh, Lydia Davis. How about that? That's brilliant. I, I was like, I would, I would try to write these all down, but luckily for all of you, we are recording tonight's event and it'll be up on our YouTube channel within the next couple of days. So you can just skip to the end and be like, tell me all the books. What were the book recommendations? Um, and you can get them at a good bookstore near you um, and where you can also get Jeff's awesome book in praise of good bookstores. So thank you so much for talking about book, books and bookstores. Next time you're in Brooklyn, we'll have to do a field trip to, to some stores and, oh, yes. and and talk shop even more. I'd, I'd really love to. I would too. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Have fun on the rest of your tour and, and thanks, for, thanks for doing the good work. I appreciate it. Have a good night.